Thanks for joining us on Lunch. You're watching Bloomberg Quint. I'm Harsha Subramaniam. Good afternoon. I'm Ira Dugal. Let's get straight to the headlines. A weekday across the Indian markets, the Sensex and the Nifty trading about eight tenths of a percent lower ahead of the GDP data. India's GDP is expected to record an uptick for the first time in six quarters when the July to September numbers come out later today. A behind-the-scenes look at how Reliance Communication tried to fend off an insolvency bid by the China Development Bank. That's a Bloomberg Quint exclusive. Automakers may post double-digit growth in November, shows a Bloomberg Quint survey, but it's more to do with a low base than higher demand. And GST is one of many factors that's hurting the Indian leather industry. A ground report from Kanpur coming up on the show. But first, let's take a quick check at how the markets are faring today. Navneet is here to take a closer look at some of the stocks. It hasn't been the best of days, especially on expiry. Not at all, Harsha. It's the last trading day for this month and it's also the final day for the November series. Remember, this was a five-week expiry, so a pretty long uh, expiry which one had to see. But uh, the losses uh, which you're seeing today is on account of the gap, tap open, gap down opening that we had post the Asian markets uh, were weak after the strong US GDP numbers came about. So let's see. I'll be watching out very keenly for the FI data today. Nifty, Bank Nifty, Sensex, all of them have been trading lower and the options data was suggesting in uh, support of 10,270. Remember, Nifty has also breached that mark. So next one on the downside to be watched will be around those levels of 10,250. Bank Nifty has been pretty weak and remember a lot of these banking stocks which have a huge weightage on Nifty have been dragging it lower. Pull up Nifty PSU Bank or Private Index. Both of them have seen cuts of over 1%. Besides that, the Pharma Index is also pretty weak in today's trade. Uh, the broader markets are also seeing a bit of sell-off. The advanced decline ratio will tell you that uh, the market bread today has been in favor of the declines as you can see there on the screen but uh, the nifty contributors chart will tell you what exactly is dragging the index lower so the likes of reliance industries that's one of your top losers on nifty today that's been dragging the index lower by as much as 15 points besides that hdfc which has almost seven to eight percent weightage on nifty has been trading in the red itc and hdfc bank are a couple of the other stocks but what is uh, capping the moves on the uh, downside side, I'd call it, will be Infi, India Bulls Housing, Bosch, as well as BPCL. But still, there are a couple of themes which continue to play out, even on a weekday like today. So the T stocks are doing pretty well, Harsha, and we've seen the T cycle changing in the last few sessions. We've been interacting with the management. So McLeod Russell, Jeshree Tree, and Goodrick are uh, up in trade. I mean, thank you so much for that. But let's just focus now to the broader economy. After limping and dragging its feet in the first quarter, the Indian economy may just have picked up pace in the second quarter. A Bloomberg survey of economists indicates some recovery in growth from the 2014 lows. Um, Ira is standing by to give us a sense of what's expected and whether we are behind the, the demon and GST hurdles. Ira. That's the big question, Harsha, and that's why this GDP number is a little bit more important than most others. Uh, these are the expectations. Bloomberg News Survey are suggesting that the gross value added growth in uh, the second quarter would be at 6.2%. That's the median expectation. Uh, the high on that survey is at 68 and the low uh, is at 57 Just to make the point that there's still a wide range of expectations, nobody entirely sure how this number will play out. On the gross domestic product, if that is your preferred indicator, then uh, the median expectation is at 6.4. Uh, the high is on 7.1 and the low is uh, is at 5.9. Those are the headline numbers. It'll be very important to watch the uh, segment numbers as well. Uh, remember, there are eight sectors uh, that get reported as part of GDP. Uh, among them, I've picked three here, which uh, should be important to watch. Manufacturing uh, has been coming off. It anyway was never very particularly strong, but last couple of quarters, it has weakened a little bit further. Uh, so it'll be important to see whether that comes up. There could be some continuing volatility on manufacturing because of GST, although it's not clear whether the impact of GST would be only on the informal sector to what extent will it get covered in the GDP numbers you know that's still a gray area uh, on financing and construction uh, you should see some pick up on the assumption that most of the hit was an account of demonetization uh, so financial services at 6.4 should perhaps normalize a little bit further after a dip in Q4 uh, and construction which was weak at 2% growth in uh, the first quarter may also see uh, some pick up by the way this is all GVA components that we're talking about uh, in terms of the expenditure side uh, you know we want to see what happens 
things in particular to government consumption. Government consumption expenditure has been growing very rapidly for the last many quarters. Uh, but if the assumption is that the government's own finances are stretched, uh, maybe this growth in government consumption expenditure uh, will start to flatten out. It's already come off between Q4 and Q1. Uh, you have fairly steady uh, you know, growth in the private consumption side. No reason to expect that, that would change dramatically. Uh, gross fixed capital formation picked up a little bit. It could pick up a little bit more from, from here on, uh, partly due to a base effect, but also because there is some early, not big capex, but some early sort of activity that is picking up in sectors uh, which are again being pushed uh, by the government. Uh, so those are the broad expectations on exports. There has been a healthy debate on whether exports are a big reason uh, for the slowdown also on manufacturing and also feeding into the GDP numbers. Uh, JP Morgan's Shadrach Chinoy has been pointing out uh, the difference in growth rate in exports in the last cycle, in the 2003 to 2008 cycle, and in the 2013 to 2017 cycle. But there are others who point out that you shouldn't look at exports in isolation. You should look at, look at net exports. Uh, but the, you know, we leave that debate uh, until after the numbers come in. Uh, we spoke to Sonal Varma earlier today uh, to get her thoughts on how she sees this number, how important it's going to be. Let's first hear out a bit of that conversation. Our broad expectation is that uh, the numbers uh, should pick up, uh, so giving a clear signal that the economy bottomed out in the June quarter and uh, the drags because of demonetization and also because of GST are fading off. So that's broadly what we're expecting. Uh, in terms of the numbers, uh, we're looking for uh, GVA growth uh, to pick up to 6.3, that's up from uh, 5.6. Uh, and uh, GDP growth uh, to also pick up to about 6.2 from uh, 5.7. Um, the composition of growth, of course, will be quite uh, important. Uh, you know, this particular quarter we've seen uh, lower uh, agriculture uh, production for the summer, so we're expecting agriculture to slow down. Uh, but there's uh, sort of more than offset uh, by two things. Uh, one is restocking ahead, uh, you know, after GST. Uh, which will benefit the manufacturing sector and uh, remonetization of course continues so that should be positive for a lot of private services uh like construction, trade, transportation. So more of private sector driven recovery is what we're expecting. I think one thing to also watch out for uh, will be government spending uh, because that has been a big contributor to growth in the last three, four quarters. We are expecting that to actually be uh, significantly less of a contributor to growth this time around. Uh, Sonal, uh, just picking up on specifics now, so on manufacturing, for instance, uh, you know, we've all been talking about GST. We still don't know how things have settled, have not settled. Uh, but I don't even know whether the parts that have not settled would reflect in the data because that may still be in the informal sector. Uh, what would your sort of understanding be of manufacturing activity right now, both from the GDP numbers that we see, but also from your own indicators? Right, right. So, I mean, you know, when we try to assess manufacturing sector, there are a couple of things we look at. One is, of course, the manufacturing production numbers, and uh, that has definitely picked up in the, uh, you know, in the September quarter versus the previous quarter. Um, and the uh, second is uh, to look at, uh, you know, how corporates in the manufacturing sector in general have done uh, this quarter in terms of their sales and profitability. And those numbers are also uh, much uh, better. So uh, the uh, indicators do suggest that the manufacturing sector should recover in the September quarter. But like you said, uh, there are obviously some sectors, you know, the smaller, uh, uh, the small and medium enterprises, uh, the SMEs, particularly in the exporting sector, uh, which are still feeling uh, some of the negative effects uh, because of uh, GST. Uh, so it's not all clear uh, as far as GST uh, negative effects are concerned. Uh, but uh, uh, for the September quarter, we do expect a better uh, number compared to the June quarter. So in terms of what this does for the RBI's uh, decision coming up in a week or so, uh, so I mean, I think your latest note suggested that you expect them to stay on hold. So unless we get a really weak number, that probably would not change or your call would not change? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think, uh, you know, the base call is that uh, they're going to uh, stay on uh, hold. Uh, it's not just the forward-looking outlook on uh, growth. Uh, we have started to see, uh, you know, uh, an increase in oil prices. There are specific food products where prices have started to pick up. Uh, and, uh, you know, globally, the monetary policy cycle is moving towards more normalization. So in that uh, context, the baseline should be that the RBI stays on uh, hold. Uh, and uh, even if the growth numbers do disappoint, I think, uh, you know, 
fundamentally uh, a lot of the disappointment on growth which is happening right now seems to be happening because of supply side uh, disruptions and uh, therefore the solution has to be to try to resolve the issues that exporters or SMEs are facing AS, uh, you know, as soon as possible in order to get uh, growth going. Sunil Verma of Numira talking about the economy. Meanwhile, Finance Minister Arun Jaitley seems to have stuck a more realistic note. Just a few hours before the second quarter GDP numbers come out, uh, he was speaking at the Hindustan Times summit and he says that India's growth rate seems to have standardized at 7 to 8%, admitting that a 10% annual growth rate is a tough ask. The Finance Minister says external factors have to be very favorable for the country to post a double-digit growth rate anytime in the near future. All right, speaking about the external sector, our exports is one segment that has weighed down the Indian economy this year. And Ajay Sahai, Director General at the Federation of Indian Export Organizations, cites structural issues specific to India, uh, which are the cause for the slump. In a conversation with Bloomberg Quint earlier today, uh, he stressed on the need to address some of those problems. Listen in. Let us look at uh, these factors. There are few cyclic in nature which will improve with the passage of time. Let us take the case of currency appreciation otherwise. But there is a structural problem with Indian exports. And in many of the key sectors, we are losing our competitiveness. It is largely on account of uh, unskilling of workers, rigid labor laws, infrastructure bottlenecks. And these are things which needs to be added. And I'm sure that with the passage of time, currency will stabilize, Indian rupee may depreciate also, global trade will improve. But unless we address these structural issues, it will be very difficult to push Indian exports. Global trade, however, is on a boom. 2017 was expected to be a year of a trade war. Instead, the IMF is projecting trade volumes to have climbed 4.2% over the year. That's almost double of the 2.4% growth in 2016. That would be the first time that trade had outpaced output growth since 2014. Such outperformance was a regular occurrence in the pre-Lehman crisis days. Uh, among the winners, big manufacturing powerhouses like Germany and China. Even electronics producers like South Korea are gaining. Uh, Caterpillar, Samsung are some of the companies that are cashing in on this export boom. No one saw this coming. Absolutely. But let's move away from the economy into a Bloomberg Quint exclusive. Reliance Communications said earlier this week that it was surprised when its lenders, uh, in particular the China Development Bank, filed an insolvency case against the company. Was that really the case? Vishwanath Nair has uh, got an exclusive behind-the-scenes look at what was going on in the days that led up to that insolvency petition being filed. Vishwanath. Yeah, you're right, Ira. This is this is sort of a behind-the-scenes look. Uh, so what happened was in, on uh, Friday, that was the 24th of November, uh, the China Development Bank, CDB, which is one of the larger lenders uh, to Reliance Communications, had filed an insolvency petition at the Mumbai bench of the NCLT. Uh, following this, uh, this report came out on Monday. Uh, Bloomberg Quint reported it first. They, we talked about uh, how uh, they have appointed uh, ANM as their preferred uh, insolvency resolution professional in the case. Uh, following that, by Monday evening, the company came out with a statement saying that it was surprised uh, by what uh, CDB did. It said that uh, this was premature and untimely. Uh, but what we have come to know through our co calls to, uh, to bankers as well as a letter that we have accessed, a communication between the company and the lenders, uh, is that the company was already aware of the impending uh, insolvency petition. So the, this quote will uh, pop up on the screen right now. It says here that the company was informed on Wednesday, which is the 22nd of November. Uh, this was that, that there, there is going to be an insolvency petition coming in from the Chinese lender. There are three, uh, China Development Bank, ICBC Bank, and Exim Bank of China. The three of them put together have an exposure of about 13,000 crore. And uh, the company says that they are, they are discussing it with their lawyers. They are likely to go uh, for insolvency. Now, this is important because this is a communication that the company has made to the domestic lenders. Essentially, what they're trying to say is that you need to come and intervene uh, so that the Chinese lenders do not uh, file for a case and that we don't have to go through the whole insolvency process ourselves. Uh, the second quote here will show you what, why the company is so eager to get the banks into the picture. It says here the 13,000 crore, they're all secured lenders, right? Uh, so if a secured lender with a large exposure goes to the NCLT, says that the company has defaulted on my loan and I need to admit it to the uh, insolvency and bankruptcy court, it is likely, most likely, that the case will get 
uh, admitted into the whole process. Once it gets admitted, though, the company says that what the zero write-off plan that the company came out with in October, uh, the implementation of that and the execution of the SDR scheme, which the lenders had approved in June, uh, both of these will be in trouble. So you know they want the bankers to come and intervene in some way or the other so that this doesn't happen. What is this intervention? That, that is uh, very specifically also detailed in this letter that Puneet Garg wrote to the core committee of uh, creditors. Uh, what it says is that you have to pay up, uh, this is part of the proposal that they made, you have to pay up uh, 97 uh, 0.5 crore rupees to these Chinese lenders so that they get some form of comfort and they don't go to the NCLT. Uh, how exactly are they proposing that this 97.5 crore be paid off? It will be paid off from the proceeds uh, that the company will receive uh, by uh, uh, by a real estate deal, not a tower deal, a real estate deal that it made with Brookfield. Uh, so essentially what they're trying to say is that uh, we are selling some land for 800 crore and th from that 800 crore we'll pay about 97.5 crore to the Chinese lenders. Either that or that you borrow from a third party and then you uh, repay that third party on a priority basis by selling off some of the other assets. Both these proposals were considered by the bankers at a meeting on the 25th of November and they said that uh, we are going to reject it. The company said, please reconsider. The banker said then, uh, before they could reply, well, CDB went ahead and uh, filed the case at the NCLT. All right, and that last uh, quote on your screen, Vishnath, uh, basically trying to sort of goad uh, the domestic creditor, saying that you haven't considered all of the implications of a decision not to sanction that 19.5, as uh, 97.5 uh, crore additional perhaps borrowing or money to be sent to uh, the China Development Bank. But can you tell us why, uh, you know, they were trying to push these guys into sanctioning or signing off on that plan? It's it's. Very basic, right? Because everything comes down to provisioning for the bankers. So uh, essentially, uh, for the bankers, it's it's a you know 50% on secured and 100% on unsecured assets as soon as uh, the account goes into the insolvency uh, court, and it's a large account, 45,000 crore. So any kind of large provisioning on these cases will be problematic. For the company, uh, the government passed an ordinance only uh, just a week ago, which said that defaulting promoters cannot bid for their assets. Of course, they have their conditions, and we don't know if uh, the promoters at Arcom meet those conditions. But you know. That's something that uh, can come up later as a discussion. But as of now, it makes it more difficult for them to uh, have a trust with the bankers and then go ahead with some form of resolution. So that's what we understand from our uh, sources, Ida. OK, Vishwanath, leave it there. Thank you so much for, jo for joining us with those details. Let's move on. SBI has raised interest rates on bulk deposits of over one crore. The state-owned lender hiked rates uh, uniformly across all tenors by 100 basis points. The revised rates will be effective from today. Shraddha is here with more details. Shraddha, what's the rationale behind this and what are the implications? Well, uh, firstly, of course, the 100 basis points hike in the interest rate only uh, highlights how the excess uh, or surplus liquidity that was there in the banking system uh, after uh, November has actually been uh, coming off now or getting parked in other avenues. Uh, what happened last year is uh, because of the significant um, uh, demonetization-led influx into uh, CASA uh, deposits of banks. Banks like SBI did not really want uh, any more of bulk deposits and hence they had brought down the bulk deposit rates last year uh, in November. Uh, now what has happened is uh, that because of which uh, on a year on year basis if you look at uh, SBI's bulk deposits right now they're down about 30% because of that higher base that's one. Uh, secondly the rates that they were offering for up to 365 uh, days on bulk deposits um, was below the savings account uh, day rate as well, which was at 4% that, uh, then. So that's the second point. The rates were excessively low. Uh, now what is happening is that with the demonetization links flowing out, the bank has started to look for deposits again. And hence, uh, you're seeing that 100 po uh, basis points increase or hike uh, in the interest rate on bulk deposit the bank is offering. So broadly, it's a case of very low rates getting normalized. In fact, even after the 100 uh, basis points uh, hike in the interest rate on bulk deposits uh, the bank uh, banks rates are uh, lower uh, as compared to some of the other peer banks that's what SBI has said uh, from a, a stock impact perspective it could be a slight uh, marginal negative for the bank's margins but uh, nevertheless uh, it's not going to have a meaningful impact given that um, bulk deposits as a proportion of the total deposit base uh, is very low as far as SBI is concerned uh, but do listen in to what the management had to say Anshla Khan CFO spoke to Bloomberg Quinton earlier today and this is what she had to say. Since the last 12 months, we have seen a 
significant outflow from this segment. So the bulk deposits have degrown by about 30 percent year on year. Even after raising these across the board by 100 percent, we are still way below the other market pairs. Why we have done it is that you know two things. One that you know corporate relationship, public sector enterprise relationships are on both sides of the balance sheet. So we have been we've sort of exited on the liability side completely, you know, because we are not getting these bulk deposits at all. And secondly, you know, there is also a commercial logic to it that what you get in bulk deposit, today we are offering even after the revision, the highest rate is about 5.25%. Mm. So, you know, there are arbitrage opportunities, you know, reverse repo, T-bills, etc. Mm. So it makes sense for, made sense for us at this point to uh, raise and review the position. Automakers may post double-digit sales growth in November, but uh, not because sales have suddenly shot up, uh, but it's because exactly a year ago, the government had announced the cash ban demonetization, which had dented vehicle sales. Yash Upadhyay uh, spoke to a whole bunch of dealers, 35 to be precise, across the country to tell us what is expected from the November auto sales data. Yash, over to you. Good afternoon. So, uh, first of all, uh, uh, my dealer check suggests that on a month-on-month -month basis, November has been a slightly slower month in terms of auto sales. But this has mainly got to do with two factors. One, mainly because the festive season came to an end earlier this time around, with both the Dashera and Diwali being wrapped up in the earlier month. And also, seasonally, November is a slightly slower month for the auto sales. And we'll get back to you uh, with, with more on this. But as far as numbers go, uh, for, for four-wheelers, we are seeing Maruti Suzuki dealers say that volumes could go as much as 12% uh, up, Tata Motors 17% up and for Mahindra and Mahindra, uh, this one is a key number because as you rightly said, you know, uh, because of the Prime Minister Modi's uh, announcement of demonetization in the first week of November itself in 2016, uh, the auto sales did get uh, impacted largely and Mahindra and Mahindra reported a 22% decline in their sales. So because of that lower base, we are expecting uh, their sales to go up by 38.5%, but a small disclaimer, it is just just an indicator number from a survey, so do take them with a grain of salt. So what's working for them? Well, for Maruti, it is their Baleno and the Brezza, Brezza models, which are doing fabulously well. Brezza continues to hold the highest waiting period uh, with almost 16 to 18 weeks, while Baleno has anywhere between 10 to 12 weeks. Also, the new Desire 2017 and uh, their S-Cross refresh is doing very well in the Nexa showrooms. Uh, for, uh, for Tata Motors, it is their newly launched Nexon, which is being received very well. Also, their compact sedan, which is the Tigor and Tata Tata Tiago also are doing very well in the Western and North markets. Uh, whereas for Mahindra and Mahindra, it is the Balero and Scorpio along with XUV doing fairly well in the Tier 1, Tier 2 and Tier 3 cities. But that's that as far as four-wheelers are concerned. And an interesting trend that I saw over here is the fact that a lot of customers tend to you know, defer their purchase uh, towards the end of the year. And this has got to do with the registration aspect. So they tend to buy it, they prefer actually buying the cars in a new year so that they get registered in 2018 and can save up on the depreciation cost which helps them enhance the uh, you know resale value but in the two-wheeler space again we have hero motor Corp, which is a big player in the rural segment uh, we are expecting uh, their volumes to go up by 25 percent bajaj auto another name just like mahindra mahindra could see their volumes go up by 36 percent tvs motors we are expecting a 40 percent growth in sales while royal enfield and outlier reported a growth despite of demonetization we expect it to grow by 19 uh, 19 and a half to 20 percent also another trend that i see over here is that this time around scooter sales would be picking up better than uh, the bike sales and because of that we are seeing good moves in Hero Motor and TVS Motors. So what's selling for these? Well, for Hero Motor, obviously it is their uh, uh, m uh, scooters in the Maestro, in the form of Maestro, Pleasure and Duet, while also in the entry level it is the Splendor, Passion and Glamour 125cc doing very well in the rural and semi-urban regions, while for Royal Enfield it is the Bullet 350, their top stay and uh, for uh, for Bajaj Auto, yes, it is Pulsar NS and uh, the Platina, which does quite well in the rural regions and amongst the uh, low-income segment. And for TVS, like I said, it is their scooters. TVS Jupiter claims to hold the second space in the scooter segment ahead of Heroes Maestro and is doing very well for them. Also, their Apache RTR line of models is doing very well. Yes, thank you for that. Let's move on now. India accounts for more than 10% of global leather production with factories all along the Gangetic Plain, starting from Nagpur, uh, the Kanpur in the north all the way down to Kolkata. While most of them have been around for centuries now, they get to make the transition to the formal economy. Bloomberg Quinn's Purva Chitnis travelled to Kanpur to find out that leather industry has, has to deal with a whole host of factors that have hit them in fast succession.
four cow vigilantes cracked down on slaughterhouses, tanneries were shut to curb pollution, the cash purge hurt demand, and the new nationwide tax mandated 36 filings a year, Mohammad Sharif's tannery in suburban Kanpur was thriving. आसानी से मिल जाया करती थी अवेलेबिलिटी थी अब जो है बहुत महंगा भी हो गया है किसकी अवेलेबिलिटी रॉ मटेरियल की अवेलेबिलिटी केमिकल की और जो कंपटीशन था वो भी कम था तो अब जो है थोड़ा कंपटीशन भी बढ़ गया है और जो नॉर्म्स हैं सरकारी वो भी थोड़े हार्ड हो गए हैं फॉर्मेलिटीज बहुत हो गई हैं Taking advantage of the situation, countries like Vietnam, Bangladesh and China have flooded the market with cheaper leather, making Indian exports uncompetitive. Industry is in a difficult situation. It is a very difficult time for the industry. We are having a lot of competition from different countries. From last three years, we have a negative uh, export growth. Exports have gone down by about 15 to 20 percent. Now, we want more orders, but part of that business has already shifted to China, to Bangladesh, to Vietnam. Growth news is that the factories will be removed, the work will be closed, the shifting will be closed. So, the order that the foreigners come to the order, the order will depend on the order. Now, the order will be closed. The order will be closed, 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 the order will be closed. Since leather units sourced raw skins from abattoirs, it has hurt supply. Fear of beef vigilantes has hurt the cattle trade. There has been a problem in India about the, about the slaughtering of uh, the cattle hides. Slaughtering was slowed down considerably. Less slaughtering means less raw hides. And if we need more raw hides than what they're slaughtering every day, that means that automatically their prices go up. It's about uh, 10 to 15 percent higher. Apart from the decrease in supply of raw materials, the industry has also been impacted by the double whammy of strict pollution control norms and GST. There are about 25 small shoe shops here in the by lane of Kanpur. But the retailers here are not really happy because the implementation of GST has slowed down their business. इससे 40 रुपए से 50 रुपए डिफरेंस आया हम लोगों के पैर में तो जीएसटी की जांच से थोड़ा लेदर शॉर्ट टेस्ट कर रहा है तो मार्केट में लोगों ने रेट बढ़ा दिए डबल डबल टैक्स देना पड़ रहे हैं ये जैसे नोट मंडी और जीएसटी लगी है जैसे जो है कारोबार बहुत चौपट हो गया आज शाम को सात like we are all waiting for our money to be refunded. Six months have gone down, almost five months have gone down now, and we, we are not seeing any refund coming to us. It's eating our working capital. If somebody needs blood, and if you don't give it on time, then by the time you bring it, and if he's dead, then it's of no use to him. So it is just like that. All the units, manufacturing units, they are facing a lot of hardship just because that our money is not being refunded on time. The loss in income for the tannery owners has also trickled down to employees, many of whom have lost their jobs and are finding it impossible to make ends meet. What do you get? What you get, you get half of the work. You get 8 rupees, you get 60 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 rupees. अगर ये मेक इन इंडिया में ये आया है चमड़े का काम तो हम लोग का जो भी उसके बेनिफिट्स हैं हम लोग तक पहुंचने चाहिए हम लोग तक नहीं पहुंच रहे हैं मतलब कोई भी छूट या सपोर्ट हम लोग को नहीं जो भी है आप अपने से यू आर मतलब नाउ यू आर सेल्फ डिपेंड आपको किसी का सहारा नहीं हम लोग अपने बच्चों को ये काम नहीं करवाएंगे क्योंकि इस काम का कोई फ्यूचर नज़र नहीं आ रहा है Right, that's a ground report coming in on uh, the industry there and the f troubles it's been facing. We'll take a quick break on Power Lunch. Coming up on the other side, Peter Maguire joins us from Vienna where the all-important OPEC meet is taking place. Are we live? Welcome. To 
programming that's insightful, authoritative and at your fingertips. Bringing news alive. So immersive, so new, and so addictive. You will want it no other way. The Bloomberg Terminal. Accessed only by over 325,000 marquee investors across the world. Until now. you're watching Power Lunch, let's take a quick look at the headlines at the half hour. Market still trading under pressure, about 8 tenths of a percent lower on the Sensex and Nifty on expiry day. A $2,000 drop and then a $1,000 recovery, all in a day's work for Bitcoin. Tata Sun's chairman N. Chandrasekharan reiterates the need to cut down on the number of businesses owned by the Tata Group, says tough decisions are inevitable. OPEC members meet in Vienna today as Russia agrees to extend production cuts till the end of next year. A $3,000 swing all in one day. The Bitcoin, which we've been talking about for a while, which crossed the $11,000 mark for the first time uh, late last evening, fell by $2,000 over the next few hours after the, after the network or what it was called intermittent outages could not support the sudden surge in demand. But just hours later, the cryptocurrency was back above the $10,000 mark. That's the wild ride that Bitcoin has been facing. And, you know, uh, Ira, I, the reports that how a bunch of people sort of rushed in at the last minute that saw the spike happen, and then the outages happened, and then there was a fall. Uh, stuff like this is not going to repose confidence in this as, as, a, as an asset class, uh, as a tradable commodity or a currency. And it's anyway, the conference is anyway shaky, so I think some of the Wall Street and the economists uh, who have spoken about a number of issues over many years, uh, you know, are coming out against this. In fact, Joseph Stiglitz uh, spoke to Bloomberg News uh, and he actually said that this should be outlawed. Listen in. One of the main functions of government is to create currency. Uh, and uh, Bitcoin is uh, successful only because of its potential for circumvention, uh, lack of oversight. So it seems to me it ought to be outlawed. Uh, it doesn't serve any socially useful function. Uh, it, uh, uh, we ought to just go back to, to what we always have had. Uh, and, and this is just a, a bubble, as several of your commentators have already pointed out. Let's make the whole system uh, into uh, one in which we, we use digital currency. Uh, uh, it, it's not Bitcoin. It's a basically U.S. dollar based uh, in the United States and Europe, uh, uh, a euro and the pound. Uh, but uh, it's using electronics rather than paper. Well, that's Bitcoin for you. But let's do a quick check on how the markets are faring at this point. Pradeep is taking a look at what's going on. Uh, it hasn't been a great expiry day. Yeah, actually, so yesterday when I thought, you know, the, the, didn't, didn't feel like an expiry week at all. <laughs> Today it feels uh, like it. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> and it's surprising because, you know, yesterday, uh, till yesterday, I would say, uh, markets were comfortably moving in a range of 10, uh, 350 to 10, 400. Most of the time, if you look at the last three days, Monday to Wednesday, at the end of the day, we saw a 12 to 1300 crore rupees buy figure in Nifty futures, which kind of, uh, uh, you know, gives you a very bullish indication. Although, if I had also sold uh, some 600 crores uh, in uh, the stock futures and around uh, 500, 600 crore again in cash, so maybe this was not, not really a directional call. That is what we thought, and that is exactly how it is playing out. But the uh, decline today is, uh, I would say, a bit shocking for the traders because they were ex hoping uh, to 
see a stable trade in, in today's trade and probably the option writers uh, would be in a rush to cover their positions, uh, this being the last day of the expiry and uh, they must have lost out on uh, a significant part of their gains. It's also uh, interesting that, you know, uh, 10,300 odd levels were seen as strong support even for, for the coming series. Now, today so far we have spent the day below that level and I think banks will be held responsible for that in a big way. Not only SBI that declined after uh, raising the de deposit rates, but, but you also look at Excess Bank, HDFC. These are some more uh, names in this sector. So that is one sector which is responsible for the decline. However, if you look at the overall market, uh, you know, market breadth is negative. That's true. I think around 60-40 was the equation when I saw it last. But if you uh, look at the capitalization of this market breadth, or uh, better than that, if you look at the volume-weighted market breadth, and, and, uh, which, which uh, basically means that you look at the stocks which are moving with highest volume in the market, actually you will find the three out of four stocks are in positive territory outside uh, the FNO space. So mid cap, uh, you look at T stocks that bounce back in today's trade. You have some of the you know uh, uh, movers over the last few days now. Shankara built on. You have Nuclear Software. They are all doing well. And then there is a stock specific uh, uh, you know movement uh, because of results. So Mukta Arts came out with good numbers. It has been rewarded. Uh, TBZ has been moving up, but numbers were not that good. So that looks more as usual. There is no panic outside the FNO space. That is the point uh, I am kind of trying to make. And if global markets don't really surprise us on the negative side, one would expect that this, this is a volatility uh, linked to the expiry and will subside and we'll probably find a base uh, you know, soon. All right, Prabhupada, thanks so much for that. But uh, I just want to talk to you about the commodity markets as well. Big uh, OPEC meeting coming up. How are the markets positioned ahead of that? So, well, we are uh, uh, trying to guess uh, what would be the agreement, three months or nine months, and uh, much will depend upon that. Uh, we have seen a, 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 a significant up move, but over the last two, three days, traders have been booking a little bit of profit because there were talks that probably, you know, the extension will, will not go beyond three months, at least for now, and probably there will be a review in June uh, 18. So that is, uh, I think, one single uh, point that uh, traders will be looking at. Uh, interestingly, gold is holding steady. There is not much movement there. But Base metal is another uh, segment to really watch out for as of now. If you look at it, aluminium and copper, when I checked last, were down one, one and a half percent. Now, aluminium is uh, in particular down because the data coming from China kind of indicates that the kind of production cuts that market was expecting from China have not really played out. So I think Chinese data remains in focus and, and Chinese supply and also demand uh, will kind of determine the direction here. So market is waiting for more clarity on, on both these fronts. And this is seen by traders more as a short term uh, correction or consolidation in base metals. Pradeep, thank you for that. But I'm going to extend that conversation with Peter Maguire, uh, CEO at XM Australia now join is in fact at the, at the OPEC meeting in Vienna and he joins us on the phone line. Peter, thank you so much uh, as always for joining in. So what's the expectation? Uh, is, the, is, it, is it a done deal that there is going to be a nine-month extension? Well, good morning and thanks for inviting me. Look, I feel as though that where it's sitting at the moment, it will probably run around about three months. They might be an extension further out to nine, but there's just so much consideration. Where, are the, where does Russia play? What's happening as far as those other OPEC members? We understand Saudis and where they're positioned, but it's theoretically... It might only just be that three months and then they'll look and re renegotiate or look at the overhang come at the end of June. So the jury's out. We're standing outside the building waiting to get into the meeting and uh, it's an exciting, snowy Vienna. Okay, so if I were to offer you two scenarios, Peter, if there is a three-month extension, how do you see prices behaving in the near term? Uh, and if there's a longer, uh, longer extension of uh, production cuts, what would be the price, uh, you know, pricing in that scenario? I think for a short term, three months prices will probably hold around this level. There's been, there's a lot of, um, as we all know, it's had a very nice rally over the last two months. And I think they'll probably hold at these sort of levels uh, unless something happens dramatically with US dollar. But I feel as though these sort of price points are pretty much where true value is. Uh, if we go out to nine months, you may see um, markets take that on board as a, a probably a positive, more positive note. And you could see... Uh, price increases from these levels. So that's where my mind's at. I think that's where a lot of traders position themselves and they're probably considering those sort of points at the moment. What's the thinking, what's the you know conversation on in Vienna at this point, uh, Peter? Is shale a matter of concern? Is that point of debate at all? Uh, yeah, look, certainly is. I mean, we've got to be mindful. I mean, these guys are pulling oil out of the ground at 40 bucks, 42 barrel. 
in US and uh, as oil sits around these sort of high 50s to mid 60s sort of price points, there's no doubt that you're going to see a further, uh, I think, further increase as far as shale producers and the, the profit and the potential is just too immense not to be involved. So that's going to greatly impact, I think, in the short to medium term and let's just see what happens come you know, February or March. If prices hold these, these levels, you're going to see a lot of very, very happy shale producers coming out of America. Earlier today, we had an interview with the, the, the Nigerian Minister for Oil who says that even Russia is working towards uh, a nine-month extension. Uh, is Russia clearly calling the shots at this OPEC meeting this time? Well, from what we've heard, I think Russia is playing a very, very close hand. It'll be interesting to hear what Minister Novak has to say later in the day, mm. uh, or probably this morning. I mean, it's only 9 o'clock now. And... Um, I think that they're the wild card. That's the real, you know, elephant in the room. What's prepared to happen? And if uh, if they tie themselves together, the Russians and Saudis, then it's going to play favourably, and that could be the agenda for the Aramco float uh, IPO later in 2018. They want to see higher prices, so there could be. Um, that's probably pretty much on everyone's mind as well. So let's see what happens in the next couple of hours. It'll be very interesting by about 11 or 12 o'clock. Question, uh, Peter. Once this news event is out of the way, uh, how do you see the demand supply situation? On one hand, you've got U.S. oil production at record levels. Uh, do you see the supply and demand dynamic sort of stabilizing? Well, I think so. I think demand's very, very strong. You're looking at three percent global growth probably for the best part of 2018, and I think that the, from a consumption side, it'll probably only increase. So it's very, very nice for to be a producer. You've still got 140 million barrel overhang, and uh, you know to get to that five-year average, so that'll probably wash itself out by May or June or July next year. Um, maybe a little bit later, but I think prices will probably hold around this level, and let's just see something dramatic happen, be it geopolitical or something. But uh, it's not a bad time to be in oil at the moment. Peter Maguire, pleasure as always. Thank you so much indeed for joining us. That's the action at Vienna, where the OPEC meeting is taking place. Uh, oil prices haven't moved dramatically today, indicating some sort of agreement may be on the cards. Gita? All right, let's bring the conversation back home. And Chandrasekharan has reiterated the need for Tata Sons to cut down on the number of businesses it owns. He said, and I quote, we have far too many companies in the Tata group and some level of consolidation is essential. Chandra was speaking to the Tata Review. Bloomberg Queen's National News Editor Sajit Mangat is here. Sajit, uh, can you sum up for us what message he sent out through this internal interview, actually? So it's, it's pretty much uh, in line with what he has uh, articulated when he took over that, you know, he's going to consolidate the businesses of Tata. And, uh, and now he uh, set out clear parameters. Uh, in the last few months, we have seen that uh, as part of the consolidation and you know shutting down of key businesses, he has uh, gone and taken action against Tata Tele. You have uh, Tata Steel Europe, JV, which has come in. Uh, the next big thing is the leadership uh, vacuum which is there in the top uh, that's his, he's trying to address that he's making them into clusters and we have to, spoken about that he will go for cluster approach uh, to get uh, every you know big vertical ha having a ceo and then multiple business reporting to the business so you know he spoke about tata steel tcs and tata motors and then he spoke about financial services within financial services he has he, uh, the nbfc the insurance arms all of them uh, the amc all of them will come under it uh, now it doesn't have a CEO at the top for the financial services, but infrastructure is where uh, a lot of consolidation is expected because Tata's over the last few years have opened up a lot of infra, infra company, Tata Realty or Tata Infra and all that kind of stuff. And now you have Banali Agrawala from GE who mm -hmm. has joined them to head the entire vertical. So that consolidation will happen in terms of, uh, you know, he will streamline the entire business is there. Consumer business is another one where Tata T, Tata Chemical, you know, uh, uh, or uh, Tata Global Beverages and other, uh, uh, you know, are are almost uh, consumer focused that titan you know all, all of them are consumer focused and they need to be come into one vertical there that consolidation is going to happen and travel and hospitality is another where a consolidation happened with, with respect to shutting down some overseas overseas loss making businesses and you know making making the businesses profit so this is something which he's been talking about and now he's basically emphasizing that this is what is going to happen and some tough decisions would be taken as he embarks on that road. Because the key thing which he's looking out for is in operating performance, capital allocation, which is uh, which will bring in good returns for the shareholders, whether it's Tata Trust or the shareholders of the listed companies. So that's something which is very focused, uh, uh, you know, typical and Chandra approach. No, but you know, Sanjit, this is interesting. You know, this is exactly what Cyrus Mistri said too, right? Return and 
capital was something that the, that the group wanted to see for most group companies. Uh, but is there any evidence of the, the group might exit businesses? Uh, so rather you, than you, you already have telecom where it's uh, exiting businesses. Some mm. of the businesses would be merged with some of the other companies like Tata Sky or Tata Communications, which has been articulated well by the Tata Group. Mm. Uh, there, there are Tata Ceramics, which it, it, it has shut down. Uh, what I've been told is that Tata Infrastructure or Infrastructure as a group, mm. there would be some shutting down of businesses there mm. because like it seems that they have gone and done uh, you know uh, and someone told me the scale and impact mm. that would be something which will be looked very closely if a business is not scalable and if it doesn't have an impact they will not be in that business mm. so you have to be in a business which can be scaled up mm. and it cannot uh, be a business where you just a, a token thing and you stay there and you cannot uh, you know b bring in returns going forward so scale and impact is something which they are looking at uh, and they will be only on those businesses where they can be of scale and impact okay Sajid, thank you so much for that that's in chandrasekharan in an internal uh, you know magazine interview to the group but get us get a sense of what what the uh, what the big boss is thinking let's move on sare gamma has surged over 300 percent this year this is an anomaly for the stock that's remained largely range bound over the past 10 years, what's caused this big re-rating? Why is the analyst community suddenly taking notice? Saloni is standing by with some analysis. Saloni. So basically talking about the company first, it is a pure play music and content uh, providing company owned by Mr. Sanjeev Goenka. Now it has a market cap of around 1500 crore, which is the lowest among all the listed companies of uh, Mr. Goenka. Now uh, the key USP of the company is uh, that it owns uh, music rights for over 1,20,000 songs and over 3,000 hours of Tamil series programming. Now in terms of segmental revenue, uh, their music business contributes to about 87 percent now this includes their b2b business as well as b2c business now in terms of b2b business uh, uh, it is of their ott that is over the top services as well as youtube segment while b2c business consists of their new product launch which i would like to highlight uh, later on uh, while 13 percent of the revenues is contributed by their tv business that is by south tv and hindi tv now in terms of return ratios okay in terms of pricing the stock has returned almost 300 percent on a year-to-date basis while on a 12-month basis it is up over 250 percent which is quite a big number for such a company now coming to return ratios uh, both return on equity and return on capital doesn't look that appealing for fi 17 however what stands out is analyst estimates of both these ratios for financial year 2020 now analyst believes that company will be able to improve their margins uh, on return on equity as well as return on capital on the back of higher margins going ahead as well as because of the strong free cash flow that the company is generating now coming to valuations the stock looks a little expensive when you see uh, for fi 18 the pe is around 58 times while for fi 19 it is around 39 times while for fi 20 it is at 26 times so very expensive as far as valuations are concerned but this is something that we have to watch out for is uh, their balance sheet strength, the company is a debt-free company and it has managed to cut down on its debt substantially and it has a cash balance of over 19 crore on its books plus uh, Saregama owns over 12 lakh shares of CESC, uh, also it owns uh, land assets worth rupees 180 crore. Okay, so all of this looks good. Uh, what's changed? Why the surge in stock? Why the surge in uh, turnaround and expectations now? So now the company has actually, fo uh, fo uh, you, uh, you know, started focusing on their B2C segment. That is uh, their retro-looking portable audio player called Carva. Now the company launched this product in May 2017, and the company claims to sell approximately 95,000 of such units uh, in second quarter. That is from July to September this year and uh, this product actually works as an FM radio as well as Bluetooth speaker and it consists of 5,000 songs which are retro songs. Now uh, what's next for Sare Gama is uh, 
Uh, also, Anand Rati believes that the company will be able to sell 14 lakh of such units in next two years, while Kotak believes that the company will be able to sell 20 lakh such units in next three years. Now, what will work for Saregama going ahead is that the company has already started acquiring music rights to strengthen their music library, while growth in their OTT services uh, has, be, uh, has, gaining, uh, has been gaining momentum on the back of growing broadband speed, while company also looks to launch this Karva product in different regional languages, say Tamil and Bengali, as well as company is eyeing global markets for expansion as well. Now, coming to the big broking calls, Anand Rathi has initiated buy coverage on this stock uh, and has a target price of rupees 1200 crore, 1200 rupees, and they see margins moving from current 5% uh, in FY17 to 20% in FY20. While Kotak Securities has initiated buy uh, rate, has initiated coverage on the stock with a buy rating and a target price of rupees 1264 and they believe that strong free cash flows as well as st strong balance sheet will prove to be supportive for the company to achieve their medium term objectives. Saloni, thanks so much. Very interesting story there, interesting stock pick as well. In fact, identifying multi-baggers like these uh, or bottom-up stock picking is what Summit Vartak of Sage One Investment Advisors relies on. In a conversation with Neeraj Shah on our special series Alpha Moguls, Vartak says he doesn't believe in picking sectors. He says the underlying fundamentals of companies don't always match up to the sectoral outlook. Listen in uh, to a slice of that conversation. What we look for in our portfolio is that we look for minimum 25% kind of a earnings growth. And it's not that easy to find in a, you know, in an economy which is growing nominally at, in single digits. Sure. Right, so you need to find global themes where there is structurally, you know, big changes happening across the globe. Now you look at specialty chemical business, majority of it which was controlled by China. Now, what's happening in China is, I mean, everyone is aware of uh, the pollution control issues. Yeah, but I think the, the second issue is the growth they achieved, you know, was not based on profitability. You know, they just went for volumes. And because of which their debt level, the same thing which is happening at the country level, was happening even at the company level. Now, you can't just sustain that for long because you can produce volume, then you have to dump it at whatever, you know, below cost. And that's where the, the, the debt level go, goes up. Now this government is forcing these companies to first of all make pollution, you know, take that into order and also, uh, you know, go for profitable growth rather than just volume growth. You know, employment was the main focus then. I don't think it's the case now. Now they want to make it more sustainable. If that's the case, their pricing has to go up, you know, mainly because of pollution solutions that they will have to fi find at the same time if they can't take debt they have to finance this internally sure. their prices have to go up and that's where india has become a much level playing field you got to find niches in there you know you can't just go across specialty chemicals because there are certain niche where india is probably just two or three percent of the market whereas china is 70 75 percent so that's where the growth will happen yes and a lot of these chemicals are generally approved you know, by the customers. So what happens is that if certain plant shuts down in China and a customer doesn't get it, they can't just switch to some other plant or a country because the approval process itself takes four to six months. And if that is the case, irrespective of what the cost is, they would want to develop a second source. And India is that second source. Okay. So even if India has to set a <coughs> higher price, they're completely fine because they need an assured source so where if something goes wrong, at least they have approved plants where they can... Uh, so what's this niche area and specialty chemicals? I mean, is there a specific area that an Indian company might be supplying to? I mean, would it be fluorochemicals? There are multiple, uh, there are, there are multiple of those. So, you, uh, um, so uh, you know, there are companies in rubber chemicals, uh, you know, there are c companies in, you know, niche specialty ke chemicals. Uh, but you got to be careful that these, you know, the growth that is coming through sure. is not just a short-term blip, just because a couple of plants are shutting down. You got to make sure that the company, you know, who is taking advantage of that, it has inherent strength and it has inherent com competitive advantage. You know, mm -hmm. they are not just benefiting because of, you know, some kind of anti-dumping duty, which is, 
you know, which can be short term. You never know which you, it may go away. Sure. So I think you, if you focus on those, they are available at pretty reasonable prices. Okay. Uh, you get 20-25% uh, kind of a growth. And that's a good idea to be in. Okay, so we have two minutes on the show yes. left. So yes. I just want to quickly take one minute for the other themes. And if you can run through auto angst, if you believe there's a particular pocket within auto angst which will do well. 30 seconds for this. I, I feel auto angst is, uh, you got to focus on the low, so two-wheeler and the four-wheeler segment. The four-wheeler lower end of the uh, prices. And also the ones which are globally oriented. Mm -hmm. I think in unemployment is a big issue in India. If India has to address that, they will have to make sure that more and more manufacturing happens through India. They will have to make India as a export-oriented market. And there are companies who are globally the most competitive. I think they will take advantage of that. All right, let's move on. India's competition watchdog has pulled up the BCCI for abusing its dominant position. Uh, the competition control uh, found India's cricket control board guilty of anti-competitive practices and slapped a 52 crore fine on, on it. Shivani Saxena sums up all the details. BCCI is an autonomous body that regulates cricket in India. It also organizes private commercial leagues like IPL. You would recall that in 2007, Indian Cricket League was proposed by Kapil Dev. But most cricket experts said that it failed because it didn't get any backing from BCCI. It is this conduct that will likely be impacted by CCI's order. This is because the competition watchdog has held that BCCI is the only player that can organize cricket leagues or similar events. Because as the regulator of this industry, BCCI itself frames the rules that permit only this organization to organize these leagues. The CCI noted that BCCI has abused its dominant position by preventing other commercial leagues to emerge and that has only served the interest of BCCI and the bidders of IPL broadcasting rights. In conclusion, this regulator has directed BCCI to refrain from such anti-competitive behaviour but has left the doors open for the board to continue to frame the rules while granting approval for commercial leagues. Right, IPL uh, Chairman Rajiv Shukla said that the board will study the CCI order and could even challenge it if required. Listen in. Well, as far as Competition Commission's uh, verdict is concerned, we will legally understand it, we will legally examine it, and if need be, then we will appeal against it to the court. All right, out of time on the show. Thank you so much for watching. Are we live?